أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا وشفيعنا مولانا سيدنا محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حبيب الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان اليوم الدين أما بعد فسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, once again, it's an, an honor, really, uh, to sit in front of people, or rather to be part of a group of people who want to know more about the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In no way pretending that I will say things you do not know. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَةً تَنْفَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That the reminder is of a great benefit for the believers. And the first thing I would like to kick off with or start with is by asking ourselves the question, why are we here? What is the reason that we want to study the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? Apart from getting to know him more, apart from getting to know his biography better and explore the depths and the wisdoms behind it, but what is the real reason? Very often when we study the seerah of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, we study it from a certain perspective. And I believe that very often, not always, one aspect of the seerah of the Messenger وسلم, is not really explored. And this is the ummah of Rasulullah Because if the Quran and Sunnah found their way to us today, it is only because the Prophet ﷺ had this exemplary community. A community that carried Qur'an and Sunnah, that defended Qur'an and Sunnah, that stood up for Qur'an and Sunnah, who respected Qur'an and Sunnah. So if we now look at the seerah of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, instead of looking at it just to get to know the Messenger of Allah والسلام, rather to explore two dimensions. The first one, as we said, is what made of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, the perfect leader. Not that he was chosen by Allah. This is something nobody can attain. Prophethood. Be becoming a Rasul, that's gone, that's finished. But rather, what were the general characteristics and what were the qualities as a leader in the Messenger of Allah والسلام, that we can reproduce? This is one. Because we want, once again, an ummah that is revived, an ummah that not only talks about religion, but walks religion. Talking is one of the most easy things one can do. You just need to open your mouth exactly like I do here, right in front of you. Here I am talking about Islam. This doesn't turn me into anybody. This doesn't make me important with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is about what I do with the message that I carry and with the message that I spread. So the first thing is, what are these general characteristics that made Muhammad والسلام, this perfect leader so that we can reproduce leaders that are serving the community. Very often today, a leader is the one, there's a hierarchy where the leader or the imam or the scholar, you know, is sitting on his throne and everybody else are his subjects. This is not how the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. If there was a bag to be carried, he would be the first one to do it. If there were people to be protected, he was the first one to do this. If a masjid had to be built, he was the first one to build it. So what are these characteristics? Secondly, how can we once again become this submissive ummah to the teachings of Allah Jalla wa ala and the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is very important because they had something why Allah, there was a reason why Allah Jalla wa ala chose them to be the carriers of the message of the Risalatain of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because what we forget is that the Qur'an is a revelation, but so is the Sunnah in another way. It is also a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala refers to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying that he doesn't speak on his own behalf. He doesn't just talk. No, he's a wahyun yuha. 
he also is a revelation. So who now was carrying the wahyain, the two revelations? The companions. So what made them so special? What was it that they had in their souls, in their minds, in their bodies, that turned them into or that united them? So this is the second thing that we want to explore. So on the one hand, the Messenger ﷺ needs qualities as a leader. Then on the other hand, the qualities of the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ. When, when I embraced Islam by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 24 years ago, then when I read about the Muslim community, you know, in the first weeks of my Islam, the only thing I was doing was reading about Islam. I was re reading in the books of Ibn Rajab, the books of Imam al-Ghazali, and so forth. And when, when I woke up, it hurt me. You know, when I woke up, I saw that this Muslim community that has one Lord seemed to have a million different hearts. While their heart should be one. So what is the thing that can reconnect our hearts? I mean, today... You can very easily tell somebody, Salaamu Alaikum, then you go away and there you are gossiping about the person, about the person that just fed you, about the person that just helped you, about the person you smile, that you smile to. Hi, how are you? Then you go away and you start gossiping. So there is something going on. We want to revive this. We want to have the sense of a community. We, you know, we have to overcome these differences. Like now, for example, if I am a tablighi, it will be very difficult for me to sit with a Salafi, for example. Why? Why would this be the case if we have one Prophet, والسلام, and we have one Qur'an? And this is, even though that there were differences between the Sahaba, there were differences of view, not differences of hearts. There were differences of view, but they were not differences of heart. If you look, and this is just an introduction at Aisha radiallahu anha, in the book of Imam Zarkashi, rahimahullah azawajal, where he mentions the differences between Aisha radiallahu anha and the other companions, they were more than 127. Being it related to fiqh, being it related to sirah, and in some cases to aqidah. Not of course the core of aqidah, but did the Prophet والسلام, see his Lord, yes or no? She differed in this with uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, for example. But nevertheless, they they were, Umm al-Mu'mineen, you are our mother, we respect you, we hold you high. So we want this community once again. We want to die while we carry within our hearts love for every single member of the community without regards his own approach of religion. Being it a bit more mystic, being it a bit more literal, be why? Because every person who is a Muslim has been given the key to paradise. Every, yani Allah found that person good enough to grant him the key to the eternal bliss to the Garden of Eden. And this is also what we will find when these companions differed in the time of the Messenger of Allah, how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, managed these polarities. How did he do this? To be quite frank, if we want to be a leader today, then you have to, you need a room and a space within your heart for every member of the community. Because if we are divided, we are weak. If we are divided, we are weak. So this is bi'ithnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala why I will be delivering this course. It might not be in harmony with your intention and the reason why you came. Because everybody has a different approach, isn't it? And it's exactly that different people look at it from a different perspective that we are able to, to, to see the entire picture. So my approach is not the only right approach. My approach is not the unique one. It is a part of many dimensions which we need to know in order to have this complete picture of the seerah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The last thing I want to say about this is that even when we one day will become leaders, we are still those who are being led. We are still reporting back to Allah. And we still imagine ourselves that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be physically amongst us and that we would report to him.
This is the duty that we carry upon our shoulders, that we say we are the ambassador of the ambassador of God sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We are going to try to carry this message because we know that the messenger of God alayhi salatu wasallam will stand up for us on the day of judgment for 50,000 years and that he won't set one single foot in paradise until he is reassured that everybody who needs to get out of hell got out. This is sufficient. So it is no longer, what can I do? How can I become a leader? There is no leader but the Messenger of God, والسلام, that's the true leader and all the rest are being led. And this is how we should feel. And only then will we humble ourselves in front of whom the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. Only then will we humble ourselves. We, are, we will never be a leader. And this is why the greater your knowledge becomes, and, and, and the greater your taqwa becomes, the more humbled you are. And this is why the scholars, they never praise themselves. If they praise someone, it's the unique, or as a human being, the one that was sent by the unique. And that's it. So now, this is what we want. We want ambassadors that work as ants, right? Not ants, ants. Okay, I'm not an English native speaker, so sometimes, last time I had the same problem. So that work as, you know, these ants, they work like very, yeah, day and night. It's ants, right? Okay, subhanAllah. And arms work as well. They, they work a lot, subhanAllah, especially during Ramadan, and so do uncles. Okay, so now, when you look at this, this is the feeling that we need to have. You know, it is we are reporting to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this hadith that Imam al-Ghumari rahimahullah azawajal has authentified and so did Ibn Salah and so, so did Ibn Hibban and so did Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah azawajal and Imam al-Qastallani they all authentified they all said that the, the following hadith is authentic where the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said my life is better for you and my death is better for you they said this is your life ya Rasulullah we see you we talk to you but what about your death and then he said inna a'malakum tu'ara Yani your deeds are shown to me. Yani in the grave, exactly like our salam. When we give salam, they are brought to the Messenger of Allah So we're not saying that, that the Prophet has the omnipotent power to see everything we do now, but the deeds are shown to him. And then he said, فَإِن كَانَ خَيْرًا If it is good, I praise Allah. And if it is bad, then I ask Allah to forgive you. So even after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, there is still this connection after his physical death. Not meaning that we are asking him or begging him for forgiveness. That's what I'm, not what I'm saying. I'm saying this connection is still there. We are working, 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 working to revive this community, to save the people, to unify them. And not only the Muslims, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was for Muslims and non-Muslims. And this is a part, one class, uh, where I will talk about the sanctity of the soul of a non-Muslim in Islam and how they were respected and the rights they were given only to then be baffled or stupefied but that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, in, many way, in many ways gave more rights to the non-Muslim than to the Muslim. So we will look at these minorities within an Islamic country or an Islamic uh, or, or the prophetic state. Uh, that the Prophet Ali Sallallahu had. So this is in brief what you can expect uh, bi'ithnillah and also every class we're going to give 10 to 15 minutes to refute some of the thoughts that we might have about the seerah which I think are important to tackle inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will always be 10 to 15 minutes and bi'ithnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the reason why we are doing what we are doing. I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless this journey it is a honor that we, wallahi, we talk and listen, subhanAllah, about and to the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi about the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we gather on the table of the seerah. And, and to be quite frank, we need to feel blessed because this is not about you. It is not about me. It is about the greatest man that ever lived on the face of the earth. It is a man that lived and sacrificed every second just for you to see the light and to find your way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this being said, 
the first thing that we uh, asked you to do, and when I say we, I don't mean my, refer to myself as we. It's just we. We decided, right? I'm just a part of the whole. So the first thing we said that we would do was to read some pages. Can someone remind me which pages I asked you to read? Excuse me? 1 to 20. 1 to 20? Do we all agree 1 to 20? I passed on 94 to 130. Yes. Yes. It was good. 1 to 20. You have to read as well 1 to 20. You're right on. Yeah, so 94 to 130. Then I asked you as well to write down for you the passages that you found to be interesting, inspiring, and then you need to share with me why. Well, you have to know when 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 Uh, I'm teaching at University of Rotterdam. I seem to be very smiley and easygoing, but when it comes to homework, when it comes to tasks, and when it comes to being on time, I'm quite severe. Because this is a part of being a ummah. If we are not structured, we are not accurate and detailed, then we can't, subhanAllah, create an ummah, let alone, yani, anyway. So, who wants to start sharing? That's the beginning. Who wants to share a piece of the passage that he or she read? And tell me why. Okay, I think the question just in the email about the same was to pick one quality. We discuss on one quality? And one quality of the prophets. Uh, maybe that was mentioned in, in the message then. But I recall having spoken about this strategy while talking. Uh, maybe it has not been mailed. But anyway, one quality is good as well. Bismillah. Let us start by that. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. You were not present in the first... Uh... Okay. Okay, Bismillah. Yalla. Who wants to start? Yes. Thank you so much. For, for me personally, I, I found that um, the laugh of the Prophet through all of the passages, uh, and also the quality of himself, um, is something that Uh, I felt it was very important because I think the good manners, the virtue, the way he dealt with people, um, not only did people towards him, mm. but they also saw him in a very positive light both before Islam and after yes. Islam. And I think also the reason why I find it quite, quite so important for myself, as you mentioned, you know, as Muslims, I think nowadays we don't always show this good akhlaq to our own people and other people. Okay. And it's quite simple for us to just pick something no. and, and do it. You know? Okay. Did everybody hear it in the back? No. no. So uh, what the, the, the brother said was uh, the akhlaq and that this excellent behavior uh, of the Messenger of Allah, salam, we don't only find it uh, before he was a messenger or, or after he was a messenger, but also before he became a messenger. And that this is very important to spread the message of Islam through behavior. So this is very, very true. As the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed Rahimahullah Azawajal, there is nothing heavier on the scale on the day of judgment than a good behavior. So good behavior, and this is why people say that if you have been, good, been given good behavior, you have been given the deen. Okay, somebody else. Bismillah. Yes, sir. Um, it was reading the chapter about the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's marriage with Sayyidina Khadija. Yes. And um, I don't know how I'd categorize it, but the way he would go against uh, some of the norms of that time of no. Arabia. So um, he was obviously known to be uh, reliable, trustworthy, honest. SubhanAllah. But, um, he was uh, very happy and willing to marry a woman maybe 20 years his senior. No. It was not always the norm yes. at that time. Um, she was actually, in some ways, kind of funding him, yes. supporting him, which again in that time of the regular, the, 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 it was you know, the norm was that the man would uh, be the breadwinner no. for the family, um, and um, that you know throughout his. Uh, age at that time when it was again fairly common for men to have maybe more than one wife, large family. He he was very loyal to yes. Khadija. He stuck with her. No. Uh, they, 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 they stuck together. They were no. in, in love with each other as well. And he, 
uh, you know, never during the time she was uh, alive did he ever marry anyone else, or only this came later on and, and in, in the later years None. as well. So I'm not sure what, how I would title that, but... Um, loyalty? Loyalty, yes. I think loyalty would be definitely one of the qualities. Okay. Equality as well. Excuse me? He, he, equality, he saw his wife as, uh, as not somebody... Back in those days, no. it was a very chauvinistic culture. It wasn't like that at all. Exactly. Tenderness, love, mm. and respect. What I would like everybody to do when you hear other people talking, the way that I learned most in my journey through knowledge is by writing down what other, other people say. You really, when at the end, I want you to go home with about everything which has been said here, not only by myself or by yourself, but writing down notes and keywords, and then you will be able to make your own prophetic sira course, isn't it? And to spread it, to, to spread it on Facebook, to you know teach it in small circles. This is what we want. As I said at the very beginning, when you get out here after eight weeks, I, I don't want you to get out. I mean, <laughs> you can stay. <laughs> so then to spread this and, and to have small circles where you will be teaching what you have been taught or you have been teaching Throughout uh, during these uh, these day, uh, any sessions, inshallah. So write down, please. Okay, somebody else. Did you hear what he said? He'd be, he's being true to his wife, Khadija, and not only this, that he uh, didn't shy away that she was actually employing him, alayhi salatu wasalam, which would go against the norms in the time of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and then also that he was loyal to her, meaning uh, uh, that that he. He didn't marry, get married to another wife, which was the custom during these days. Also that she was older than he was. And also that he married to a woman that was already married before. Which was also, during those days, quite unique. Especially if one, a woman would have been married or even married more than once. So this, all of this actually, subhanAllah, when you look at this, uh, goes against the macho culture today, where a lot of people, a lot of men rather, have a lot of conditions and prerequisites and so forth and standards that women need to live up to. And if they don't, then they are not marriable uh, you know, women. So I, I think that when looking at the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, you know, if, if you find the beautiful soul, then nothing else matters. Uh, uh, nothing else matters. Okay. Bismillah. In the back, yes. Uh, mine was shukr, or gratitude. Okay. And we know that he who does not thank the people does not thank Allah. Okay. And also that if one is grateful, like I said, I'm a if you're grateful, I should give you more. Um, and um, I heard something actually a few years ago at a COVID course which really kind of inspired me, which is that shukr isn't just to say alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. but it's also to recognize the skills that Allah has. Okay, beautiful. And to utilize those to, uh, to benefit those around you. No. Um, and that's an example that we see in the Prophet who said in all of the leadership skills and the natural qualities. Very good. That Allah. That's something that I think about. Uh, okay. Sometimes we're often quite modest and we don't think we've yes. got attributes or skills, but actually the things mm. that we have. Yes. That we can give to the community. Yes, very good. So, shukr, gratitude is also using the capacities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on you to help of, or be of benefit to other people. So, and then she spoke about, the sister spoke about modesty, which can be actually a false modesty sometimes. Uh, when somebody comes up to you and you know that you read the Quran with a very nice voice, you just know it if you do. And then people say, oh, you've got a beautiful voice. And you say, no, astaghfirullah, I really don't. Actually, you're just asking that person to say for a second time, you know, because you know that he or she will be repeating it and emphasizing. So this is why Imam al-Ghazali made it very clear. Like when you are praised, praise Allah. You can at least say, Alhamdulillah, it's, it's Allah that blessed me with it. Now I hope for him to bless me with sincerity. You know, but don't deny something you know being true. You know, that it's, it's shukr as well. Like um, Yusuf alayhi salam, he, he, he told his qualities. And Musa alayhi salam, when he wanted to be hired, you know, f by his future father-in-law, he also told very clearly what his qualities were. But this was all with dignity and, you know, and, and honesty. So anyway, a false uh, humility very often 
uh, results in wrong people at the wrong places, with the wrong positions. So if you know you're strong, you're going to do it well, you're not going to oppress people, go for it. Otherwise, maybe people who are not as suited as you will take that position. Okay, somebody else. Um, you, yes, very sorry. So, yes. so you know, I think um, you know, there are two times when uh, the Prophet has to take a very important decision. Yes. One was, you know, to where, where should he, uh, you know, uh, sort of camp during the battle of power. Excuse me? But where he should, you know, uh, camp his army. Yes. And uh, he consulted somebody who was more knowledgeable about the area. Yes. Rather than, you know, him pulling out uh, something, you know. No. That's one. The second, um, when all his companions, you know, came to Makkah to do the Hajj and uh, they had to sign the treaty and, you know, go back, most of his companions were very upset and angry that they have to go back without, you know, performing the Hajj. No. So at that time, I think he consulted one of his wives. Yes. And she, I think I don't remember, you know, whether it was in Salamat, you know, I don't remember, but... But she said, you know, look, everybody will follow you, so, you know, just go out, uh -huh. you know, sacrifice the animal and, you know, shave your head. Mm -hmm. and, and every, you know, everybody would follow. So, in two of the most important times, he actually consulted somebody. Yes. And, and took some of the most important decisions. Give, give, name this quality. I think, um, humility. Humility, do we agree? Humility. humility. The Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, asking for advice. Humility? Do we agree, Jihad? We agree. Halas, this is uh, Ijma. Uh, it's first you and then it's you, inshallah. Okay, th thank you. The first is I was thinking about wisdom. Okay. <coughs> characteristic that every good leader should have. Yes. So reading these passages, there's one is tells me about placing the black stone. Okay. That he showed wisdom, and then he showed wisdom all his life, not wisdom system. No. That's the quality that every good leader should have. Okay, very good. Allah ibarik fiq. Okay, so the last one I would like someone amongst the sisters as well to reply. Yes. Um, I really like the chapter about the seclusion. Um, okay. And how reflection on the day of judgment and Allah can have like, such an impact on you as a person. None. Okay. And how would you name this? So what is the quality that you find herein uh, for that the Prophet, the Prophet was blessed with? Patience. 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 We agree, patience. Everybody agrees? Okay. okay, let's continue, inshallah. So when we look at uh, the Messenger uh, talking about his lineage, I have a question, right? So we see that the Messenger said, that he was the son of such and such and such. But then we see on your slides that I've mentioned that the Messenger of Allah made very clear that I'm the offspring of marriage, not of adultery. Meaning that all the, yani, the, the, the parents and the grandparents and great-grandparents and so forth of the Messenger of Allah were all without any exception the result of marriage and not the result of adultery. So now which is very important to say that when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that he came out of the most pure of lineages, no? uh, that it wasn't connected to a nationality, but rather to what? Excuse me? To chastity. And the fact, of course, that the, in the lineage was Ibrahim salam, and Ismail and so forth. But that it's not like they were not chosen due to their nationality. This is not the reason or their blood. Like in, within some communities or some religions they might think. And this is exactly what the Prophet of Allah salam, emphasized when he said there is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab a white man and a black man, he said the only difference is through taqwa. And the Messenger وسلم, said, and if one amongst you falls short in his actions, then his offspring or his lineage or his ancestry won't be interceding for him. 
It's not that which will help him. So now we have to, we need to look at a question which I think is, to, is very important. Like, are the Arabs better than the non-Arabs just for the fact of being Arabs? No. But what makes the Arabs greater? What made Real Madrid great? The presence of whom in Real Madrid that then went to Juventus, for example? Who? Ronaldo. How do you know that name? <laughs> Subhanallah. Sometimes people say like, Astaghfirullah, Imam, why, why do you know this? I say, because I live on the face of the earth. <laughs> I, you know, when, when you say people like Ronaldo and they, they, they don't, like they don't, don't know then some might not, but the majority does. So anyway, so that which was a blessing for the Arabs was wujudun nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam abayna adhurim. Yani was the presence of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst them. And this is something which we can't take away from them. But it is not something that brings them closer to Allah. Rather, oh sorry, and also nothing that will help them on the day of judgment. The Messenger وسلم, told his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha, he said, Save yourself from hellfire, fa inni la ughni anki min Allahi shay'a, because I will not be of any benefit for you with Allah. Subhanallah. Look even at this, you know, <laughs> the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, like if I were to be the director or director of a university and my own son or my own daughter would like to be, you know, applies. I might say, you're my daughter, you're my son. It's not haram. Here you go. You were third on the list. Let me, you know, place you first. This would be dhulm. This is dhulm. This is a shafa'a which is not halal. Is this clear? So now, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, stating very clearly, there's no difference between an Arab and non Arab. The Prophet والسلام, saying to his own daughter, I will not be of any benefit for you on a day of judgment. So when the Messenger of Allah والسلام, referred to his ancestry and lineage, there were two great merits. One of these great merits, of course, was, was Ibrahim والسلام, and the other was the fact that he was born out of marriage. And not out of what? out of adultery. And in all his lineage until Adam alayhi salam, every, subhanAllah, every child was born out of marriage and not out of adultery. Is this clear? So this is, Allah barik fikum, very important. The second thing we see that the Prophet of Allah alayhi salatu salam, yani, well, he says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, was born in the year of the elephant, that is the year in which Abraham and he uh, attempted to storm Mecca and raise the Kaaba and so forth. So here we see that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, was protected long before all of this happened. He was preserved. And Imam Al Tabari refers to this in his Tariq, and in the Tariq of Imam Al Tabari, which is one of the most long and beautiful collections. And it has many pages. But when Imam Al Tabari, uh, in, in, during his days, yani in the 4th century, he died at the beginning of the 4th century, he said, I'm going to write a Sira book. They said, How many pages will it be? He said, 30,000. But that were very big pages at the time. He said, 30,000. They said, We will never be able to read all of this. He said, so I will make a summarized version and only make it a 3,000. All these pages that these scholars wrote were written by memory, by heart. These great books that we see were memorized by these scholars. The knowledge that they would write down was real knowledge. Real knowledge is that which is here and there, not that which is here. Let me Google it and share it on Facebook. This is fake book. This is no real knowledge. This is not you. Knowledge is that what you carry within yourself. And then people copy, paste, pretend, here I am, listen to me, I know everything. So now to come back, Imam Al-Tabari, rahimahullah azawajal, wrote this beautiful or compiled this beautiful book in Sirah, which is the Tariq Al-Tabari. What we have to know in the old books of Tariq, which is important for you because it has to do with what we are looking at, there are many stories without chain of narration. But as we see Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who was very strict in narrating the prophetic narrations, 
when it came down to passing on the seerah, they were a bit more gentle. They would accept it a bit more because it is descriptive rather than it is attributing something to the Messenger of Allah. Is this clear? Like when you talk about the seerah, you say, this happened, that happened. The ulama, they wouldn't be as um, harsh when criticizing the hadith and sometimes they would narrate it without a chain of narration. What is the danger now that is that we are going to maybe say that certain things happened, but they didn't happen, for example, or that we are going to pass on weak or even forged narrations, fake fabricated narrations, and this will eventually lead to a misinterpretation of Islam. So I truly believe that the Senate is very important. The Senate, the chain of narration, like Muhammad ibn Sirin, you know, the one of, of the dream dictionary, you know, the dream dictionary of Muhammad ibn Sirin. Who knows? I want to see fingers. Oh, one, two. Okay, good. There's a dream dictionary of Muhammad ibn Sirin, which was actually not compiled by Muhammad ibn Sirin, but by his daughter. But anyway, so now Muhammad ibn Sirin said, like Imam Muslim mentions in his Muqaddimah, Al-Isnadu min ad Al-Isnad, a chain of narration, talking about the past, the life of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the happenings in history, in the time of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, are in need of a chain of narration. So a chain of narration is a part of the deen. Is that clear? Is this clear for everybody? Am I talking you asleep? No, no, no. Okay. Source. Source. Chain of narration means, for example, Suleiman said, that jihad said, that Abdurrahman said, that Zainab said. This is a chain of narration. So everything we find in the books is not always transmitted with a chain of narration. Is this clear? So this is why some people say, for example, but we will look at that later on, that the spider pigeon thing never happened. Some say, I don't shoot the sheriff, uh, the messenger. So some, some, uh, some scholars said this, this didn't happen. There's no strong chain of narration. And it's even stronger that there wasn't a pigeon or a bird nor a spider web. But that they looked into the cave and didn't see anything. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, and if you read Quran, we place between you and those who do not believe. Yani at that time, a hijab. And yani that they can't see you. So anyway, to come back, I'm not saying it happened or didn't happen. We're going to elaborate on that later on. Just to say, we are an ummah of isnad. And this is what differentiates us between many religions that were before us that do not transmit the sayings of Jesus, alayhi salam, or the sayings of Musa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread peace over him, Amin. Yet yani they are not transmitted with chain of narrations. And when there's no chain of narration, everybody can say what he or she wants. Okay? So you will find me very harsh on uh, narrations for which we do not find a real chain of narration. Is this clear? And this is why I might be ruling out some things and might go against some things because there is either no chain or a weak chain. Is that clear? Okay. So now, anyway... The Prophet ﷺ, he was born in the year of the elephant. So now Imam At-Tabari, he mentioned in his tarikh without a chain of narration that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, his father was already preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? Yani the, the father of Abdullah, the father of Muhammad ﷺ, Yani made a promise that if Allah would give him this amount of sons, that he would sacrifice, they say the tenth, the seventh, whatever, that he would, let us say, sacrifice the tenth son. So now Abdullah, the father of Muhammad والسلام, was that person. And he was the one that was the most beloved to the messenger of, uh, to the father of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the father of the father of the Messenger of Allah. So he was the most beloved to him, so he didn't want to sacrifice him. So they went looking for a soothsayer, that was a woman who was known to see the future. And when they came to her, uh, he spoke to her. 
And she said, there is no way yani amongst the Arabs when you made a promise that you are allowed to come back on your promise. That wasn't done. People were people of their word. You know, this was one of the attributes of the Arabs. What I say is what I do. What I promise is what I fulfill. This was amongst the Arabs. So now, but they always had an exception. Exactly like within the law, there are always exceptions. If you know the law as a lawyer, you always find a certain gate and so do accountants. Anyway, so now this man said, okay, uh, the father of the, the great, grandfather of the Messenger of Allah said, I do not want to sacrifice Abdullah. So she gave him a method which had to do with throwing spears in the air or pieces of wood. And on each piece of wood, there would be a name. And that name which would be facing towards the sky would be the one that had to be sacrificed. So he wrote the names of all of his sons on pieces of wood, throw them in the air, and every time whose name would appear? The name of Abdullah. The name of Abdullah would appear. So now he said, okay, I don't want to sacrifice him. She said, then you need to slaughter 10 camels. Then he threw it again. 10 camels. He threw it again. Abdullah, again, 10 camels. Until he had to sacrifice a hundred. And then he threw it in the air and no name was visible. So now the messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, was already preserved and in a certain way honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by preserving his father. He had to be preserved because Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, was the answer to the supplication of Ibrahim. When he was building the Kaaba, together with Ismail, رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ O oh Allah, and let a messenger from amongst them, yani the Arabs, appear. So now Ibrahim salam, while he was rebuilding, raising the Kaaba on its old uh, foundations, he made a dua that there would be a prophet in Mecca. So Ibrahim's dua was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now you see that sometimes you may be preserved not because of you, but because of somebody else. Ibn Ajiba rahimahullah azawajal said in his book Iqad al-Himan that between the dua that the Prophet Musa alayhi salam made that Allah would destroy Fir'aun, Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, Fir'aun. So, that between accepting his dua and Fir'aun being destroyed was a period of 40 years. It wasn't immediately. You see that the people suffered for a long time. And then he said, and the reason why the dua wasn't answered is because Fir'aun had a mother and he was good to his mother. That was the only thing protecting him. The same day that his mother died was the day that he drowned. So we might be preserved and blessed through ways that we do not know. And this is why we ask Allah, if we see that we are blessed, Ya Rabbi, make the reason that you bless me an eternal one. You know, because otherwise we fool ourselves. Because we know sometimes what we carry inside of us. Maybe some diseases of the soul, gossiping, whatever. So to come back, the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, he was preserved before he was born. By preserving his father Abdullah. Then in a tarikh of Imam, of Imam Tabari, it carries on that Abdullah wanted to marry the, the, the future mother of the Messenger. You all know the name. What is the name of his mother? No. Amina. Not Amina. There are two Arabic names Amina and Amina. So he, and that same day he wasn't married yet, he passed, the, Imam Tabari says, the sister of Waraka ibn Nawfal. And Waraka ibn Nawfal was a scholar in the Christian scripture, or in the, in, he had knowledge of both books. So he knew that there was a prophet about to come. So now she also had this knowledge. And when she looked at him, she said, marry me. Because I see within you a light that carries the light of the future. So now, Abdullah, ibn, uh, Abdullah the father of Muhammad, والسلام, he was about to marry that same evening to Amina, which he did. And the next day when he passed, 
She said, now I no longer want to marry you because the light within you has been extinguished. Meaning, it was transmitted to Amina, the mother of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallama. So you see that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam was very well preserved even before he was born sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam because he was the dua of Ibrahim and he also was the promise of Isa. وَأُبَشِّرُكُمْ بِرَسُولٍ يعني, And I give you the glad tidings of a messenger after me اسْمُهُ Ahmad, Whose name is Ahmed. And Ahmed and Muhammad are both names of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So this had to happen and needed to happen. So this is the first part here. Now you see that the Arabs, they, they didn't count their years. They would, you know, connect happenings or, or births to happenings. Like he was born before the year of the elephant. He was born during the, the, the year of the drought. He was born then until Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu came along. So people, yani they used to connect it to this. So now the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam, was also protected by Allah when Abraham wanted to attack the Kaaba. You know, this was actually the first miracle. The first, yani one of the miracles, sorry, that preceded the birth of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So the miracles happened far before he was even born. That the climate was preserved. If you just look at, you know, the Persians and the Romans and, you know, this Arabic, you know, country was, was preserved. It wasn't attacked. Some say because there was nothing to find, you know. But anyway, it was preserved. So the climate was created so that Muhammad والسلام, would be preserved. Far away in the middle of the desert where you would expect nobody to grow out from and become someone important. But this is exactly the opposite which happened. Yani between the, <laughs> the lizards and the snakes and the scorpions, under the burning sun was a man whose light is being spread until today. And there was no Facebook, there was no social media, there were no phones. He transmitted the message through God. And when you do something through Allah, it will happen. And when you rely on yourself, it won't. This is if Allah loves you. If He doesn't, He makes you rely on yourself and everything will go well so that you forget all about Him. So now to come back, when you look at Abraha, you see that they wanted to attack the, the Kaaba and that at that particular instance, the grandfather of the Messenger of Allah made this beautiful or made a dua and then they all went to the mountains and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send upon them birds to destroy them. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ So even there, the Messenger وسلم, was protected because if he would have invaded you know, the Kaaba, he would have destroyed everything and everybody, which didn't happen. So, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Which reminds me, just to cool down, when the, the, the camel of the Messenger وسلم, refused to carry on walking. They said, Abati al Qaswa, yani Qaswa, which was the name of his camel, because the Prophet وسلم, used to name everything. Uh, they said, Al Qaswa refused, yani she's stubborn. She said, Wallahi, she is not stubborn. He said, The one that stopped the elephants is the one that stopped her. Just to show you that he would even stand up for the honor of a camel. So now you see how the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preserved through one, through marriage. Why? If there is adultery, how are you going to know who is who? He was preserved. Everything was structured. Everything was pure. Not because of pure blood, but because of pure actions. And this is what makes somebody, make, turns somebody into a pure being. So this is one. Secondly, through his grandfather not wanting to sacrifice the father of Muhammad and thirdly by what by protecting the Kaaba against this invasion so we said the miracles that showed, show us that the Prophet is a prophet happened far long before he was born is that clear? 
Okay, I want to listen to you. I, to, I spoke a lot now. So one, what is your conclusion? What are you, your reflections about what you heard? Share with me. I have one question. Yes. Um, the name of the Prophet Father Abdullah. So the name, that name Abdullah, Allah was known before this time came. Right? Yes. And that they would, at least the the the, the, the pagan Arabs would know about God or Allah, but they would use other gods as a way. Exactly. To Now, there, there were a lot of remains of the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So a lot of them would be, and, and there were um, Arabs like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and others that wouldn't drink, that would hold on to the teachings of Ibrahim alayhi salam without having a, a, a real way of code of life. But they would not uh, commit adultery. They wouldn't get drunk. They, they wouldn't sacrifice for uh, idols. So some of them remained And they, uh, they held on to the teachings of Ibrahim without really knowing the details of that message. And this is why some of them said Abdullah, because uh, when the Arabs, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, makes clear in chapter 39 in Surah Al-Zumar, yani, uh, they used to reply, The only reason why they, we worship them is because they draw us closer to God. So they believed in one maker, but their problem was in their worship. You see? So, uh, and this is why when things went terribly wrong, Allah describes them as when, uh, when they are on a boat and there are storms and tsunamis, whatever. Now they, they would call upon Allah sincerely without attributing any partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they would also say that, the, for example, the angels were the, 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 the daughters of God, for example. And they wouldn't recognize the name Ar-Rahman, for example. They would also play around with the godly names. Lat, uh, Wal-Uzza, and so forth, which they derived from the divine names and then gave it to their idols. No. Okay, what are your reflections? Please share with me. So I know what's going on in your head. Yes, please. Um, my reflection about it is mostly they tie in with my reflections in the chapters that we read. Yes. And, and the thing that Stilakami was, he was protected, like you said, preserved. Yes. That his lineage was fantastic. He was a handsome man. He was very good with him, physically wrestling, archery. Allah. And all his life he was protected. And so he was a incident when he heard the music and he fell asleep. Yes. And that happened twice and then he sort of said, this is not for me. Even that was protection, isn't that it? Was protection. And then finally, a woman like Khadija, who proposed to him, um, uh, she came from a back up village, beautiful, wealthy. No. All of this did not, it didn't enter his heart. It was almost like he had this without even noticing it. Allah protected him from... From you know, envy, jealousy, anger, pride, pride being the most, most things. It was almost as if he walked in this world, yes, whilst in a bubble. Allah just protected him everywhere. Yes. So that was my reflection from the reading, but it ties in with what you said. Very good. So, what can we now, as a community, or as a parent, or as a teacher, try to put into practice in the light of what you just said? Because this is what it should lead to, like. Preservation, preserve people, or remind our children constantly that everything good is from Allah. It is not. It is the ability. Even if Allah gives you the ability, which was a conversation I recently had with my daughter. Yes. If and even if you give the ability, success is still from Allah. You have yes. You can't hold success unless you ask Him for it. So you say, I can do this, but why am I not being able to do this? Because you haven't asked Allah. Very good. To Him. Yes. Because ultimately, it's all from Him. This is a very important point in, in education, at least. There's a very big difference between all the time saying, oh, you're so cute, or oh, you're so beautiful, oh, you have, so, you have such beautiful eyes, my baby, or oh, you're beautiful, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. At the end, what are you creating? Someone who says, I am beautiful. But if you say, Allah made you so beautiful, oh, did Allah do this for me? Yes, I did choose the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, the shape of your nose and your mouth, your teeth, your ears. Allah did this for me, yes. So now you are creating a, a, a connection, establishing a connection between the child and its maker, instead of turning it into very often an egocentric being, uh, you know, that, that loves itself too much. 
and too much of anything isn't good apart too uh, much of the dhikr of Allah but it's never too much yes okay someone else yes please um, I just want to say that um, this way of looking at the way that Allah brought about all the circumstances that the Prophet tells them that could uh, be in that place at that time with all of these people marrying each other over centuries is actually exactly similar to how all of us um, have reached where we are today. Yes. In the sense that Allah decided every one of our ancestors that they were going to marry a particular person or whatever. Yes. And um, the purpose of me saying that is not in any way to lessen about the Prophet ﷺ. Yes. State. It's just to realize that Allah has planned all of us for a particular purpose in a particular point in time. Yes. With, you know, incredible planning. Yes. Um, which should actually make us feel that there's therefore a purpose for our lives at this point in time, this place. SubhanAllah, yes. And also with these relatives, because Allah therefore also chose all our relatives, etc. Yes. And our communities. So it was really just to actually take that and apply it to our lives to realize that there's much more planning has gone into our existence Allah. than we sometimes remember. Yes, very, very good. I really like what you have said a lot. So our being the children of such and such is not a coincidence. Our being, me being from Belgium, you being from the UK is not a coincidence, isn't it? And um, I believe that everybody is created in a certain time and space because that is the space and time where he or she can find all the keys that he or she needs to get to Allah. This is the, the environment has been created. It's just for us to see it. Yes, please. You had a question or a remark. It's an observation based on what the government just said. If we focus too much on success, then we have misfortune. You can question the success of the government. Yes. Because it's not just about having success. Yes. It's about having incredible misfortune. You had an incredible what? Misfortune. Okay. Um, but it didn't affect me. And we're not best to plan there is always a plan. It's just that you don't understand at the time. Yes. So, it struck me that sabr is the most important. Subhanallah. Yes, sabr, patience and endurance. That's, that's very, very nicely put. Thank you so much for sharing this. Okay, uh, try to take notes, as I said at the very beginning. Like, there are a lot of things that have been said. And it's two hours of focus. Stay focused. And if you don't write and you don't have a pen in your hand, it's very easy to fall asleep. I saw some people closing their eyes and uh, nodding their heads. And Not that I, I, I don't take it personally, you know. I, I love you to sleep. But please, it's, it's important, write down as much as you can. Okay? Inshallah. Okay. Yes? Someone else? Yes, please. So, uh, Noticing that um, despite there being great empires at the time, so the Iranian, uh, the first empire, the first Roman, to the time. Um, Can you speak a bit louder, please? Yeah, so, despite there being great empires at the time, um, as you said, you know, amongst the scorpions and the blazing heat, these, it's not just a coincidence that you know, a great messenger came and we still have his message today. But through that, through all of that planning, you've got Allah proving to us what could be a miracle yes. um, that um, no other empire has, has ever spanned the whole earth as much as this empire did for, um, for over a thousand years. So no other empire ever lasted that long. And we, uh, even today, no, no empire is that strong. So it's, it's amazing to see that you know, through what were those um, Arabs as people look at their history now, uh, were, were known as um, fairly barbaric people in some of their practices um, and idol worshippers at that time it was generally a practice, practice even despite the fact that there were many Jews and Christians at that time yes. amongst the Arabs came this great man our prophet man, so, no. so it's, it's worth or, or from reading this you realise that it was quite a miracle and if Allah makes it happen nothing can stop it yes so the miracle of the Messenger of Allah and he's starting in the middle of the desert between great empires between all these different uh, religions and people and yet and here we are today so this is in brief 
uh, what the brother said, and, and it's indeed a miracle. Um, at what time do they pray answer him? A few more minutes? Okay. So instead of me carrying on, uh, I want to listen to one more person, inshallah, who wants to share, yes, her perspective. Okay. Tawadali. Okay. Okay. We live in a culture where, you know, if someone doesn't get along with, uh, yes, you know, their brother or whoever, they don't see them. They may not see them Yes. So even our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam carried. He did not break off relations with uh, his relatives who did not revert to Islam. Yes. Okay. Very, very. That's a very good remark as well. Um, Subhanallah. Very often, and I, I speak as a convert. Um, very often when you just became a Muslim, you, you actually are inspired by many Muslims uh, to actually break contact with your father and your mother and your grandparents and so forth. You might be, find this astonishing, but it's my uh, world uh, that was back in 1994. So, um, and, and then, yes, uh, subhanAllah, at a certain point uh, when... when uh, uh, my grandfather died. I didn't go to him. You know, I didn't go even to my grandmother to say I'm sorry and so forth and to give my condolences because they told me it's haram even to comfort her. Uh, they they told me you need to be happy, you know that, you, uh, or you need to be angry that this person left the face of the earth as a non-Muslim. So this is what people very often spread, and we we can't imagine the in, the impact of this when a person becomes a muslim goes back home they say you can't eat with your mother and father at the same type of table because they eat pork and drink wine so all of a sudden you are alienated from your surroundings and instead of being this positive vibe that they see your positive change and how you are transformed into a better version of yourself they actually see a very awkward intolerant person and uh, subhanallah and then Ties are very often broken. My, my, my sister got married. I, I didn't even, you know, uh, <laughs> told her congratulations, you know, because she uh, and so forth. My sister became a Muslim. Her, her, her husband became a Muslim. My father became a Muslim and my mother as well. So anyway, so <laughs> they all... <laughs> but all of this is wrong. We, 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 we need to, you know, to uplift and uphold these uh, family ties because this is one of the most important things that we have in Islam. So anyway, I'm not going to debate or discuss this point, but it's very uh, important that you guide converts yani, step by step to that which really counts. Like the last thing I want to say, like changing your name. Changing your name is not obligatory. But when I became Muslim, the first thing they said, you have to change your name. Now I know if your name has a you know, a bad meaning, you need to change your name. But it's not obligatory. I mean, Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu, the second best follower of the Prophet والسلام, kept the same name he had when he was on his way to take the life of the Messenger وسلم, like Umar al-Khattab before becoming a Muslim that was he, what, he, what he was about to do but nevertheless he kept the same name so it's not about names it's about realities <laughs> If everybody can quietly uh, get back to his or her chair. Um, I'm going to give you the amount of pages that you will have to read for next time. I understand that the amount of pages was only shared yesterday. Can No? Uh, so a couple of days ago. It should have been shared a long time ago, but anyway. Okay, so the pages that you need to read for next time will be page 133 um, until page, sorry, here, 194. 133 until 194. How many pages are that? Six, let us say 60 divided by 7. How much is 60 divided by 7? 9? Nine? 9 divided by 24? <laughs> so you have 24 hours for 9 pages. I think that's quite good. So please come prepared. 
اوكي اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم على سيد محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وبعد I would like to start with an important reminder and that's every time that the name of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is mentioned pronounce the salah over him even if i mention it thousand times it's better to say once one extra than one to less the messenger of allah alayhi salatu wasalam said there is no one more stingy than a person in whose presence my name is mentioned and who doesn't pronounce the salah over me what you can also do and this is the ibadah of al-fam the ibadah of your mouth is when you are listening you can still use your mouth to all the time pronounce the salah over the message of allah just go all the time instead of keeping your mouth closed you go you do, i don't have to hear it of course otherwise it will be like the humming of the bees and yeah. so we go just long slips, long slips, long slips, long slips, long slips. you can concentrate now the question is but what if i'm not concentrated well imam ibn hajar rahimahullah speaks about this in uh, in his explanation of al-bukhari under the chapter kitab badul wahi and he attributes these words to Imam al-Ghazali. And he says, and if you were to ask the question, is it better not to say dhikr or to say dhikr while your heart isn't present? And the best thing is with presence of heart. Then he said, Ibn Hajar, that Imam al-Ghazali said, rahimahullah, that as long as you start with the intention of the dhikr, that this, your intention was, for example, to pronounce the salah over the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, then it will be considered a worship throughout all the time that you are doing this dhikr. And once a man, this is still a part of our break, you see, it's not a sila course. Huh? Once a man went to the Baba and uh, he had to cut his mustache and he was doing the salah over the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, 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 والسلam. والسلam. you can imagine, you know, he, he was frightened. So uh, he said, Can you please stop? He said, you have your job, I have mine. You have your job, I have mine. The Messenger وسلم, said, like in the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi and others, قَالْ إِنَّ مِنْ أَقْرَبِكُمْ إِلَيَّ إِنَّ مِنْ أَحَبِّكُمْ إِلَيَّ وَأَقْرَبِكُمْ مِنِّي مَجْلِسًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةَ أَكْثَرُكُمْ عَلَيَّ صَلَاةَ And in another riwayah, أَحْسَنُكُمْ أَخْلَاقًا The ones who I love most, and who will be sitting the nearest to me on the Day of Judgment, are those who pronounce the salah more over me than anybody else. It is even like Imam Ibn al-Jazari, rahimahullah azawajal, mentioned in his book, Al-Hisn al Hasin. Now, he, he mentioned that a man, and, and, and this is also in the Mu'ajam of Imam al-Tabarani, it's a sound hadith. The Messenger, sallallahu there was a man that came up to the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, a third, a third of my night prayer was just salah over you, and the rest was dua for myself. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, a thuluthu khayr. Naam? He said, a third is good, but more is better. <laughs> the next time he came back and he said, Ya Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasallam, two thirds of my dua and supplications were for you, and one third was for myself. And then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, two thirds is good, but more is better. The next time, you know, after the next night, the man came back and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam All of my dua was for you And nothing of it was for me And the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said When someone does this Then Allah will gather All his worries of this life And the next And take care of it And this is why When you sometimes want to make a dua Like imagine You are praising the beloved one Or pronouncing the salah Over the beloved one of The one that Allah loves more Than everybody, anybody else Then Allah will take care of you and he might even give you better than that which you wanted to ask. So try to create. Subhanallah, Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah azawajal mentioned in Seer Alam Nubala that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had to put stones in his mouth to stop him from doing dhikr when going to the hammam. Because his tongue got so used to the dhikr of Allah azawajal that if he wanted to go into a place where you're not supposed to be dhikr that he had to remind himself that he shouldn't. Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah azawajal mentions in his book that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu used to do more than 10,000 istighfar a day. So the dhikr very often is wrongly perceived as to be only for a part of the community 
it has always been for the whole of the community. Is this clear? So this is why you can't and you do anything better, even while listening to a class. Um, you know, keep on doing it. It's difficult, but create this habit. You know, because Allah, Allah. Okay, that's it. Now I will see your mouths moving, and uh, then I will say, "What are you mumbling about?" Okay. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وعلى أزواجه الطاهرات أمهات المؤمنين وأصحابه الطاهرين قدوة المسلمين وبعد So we are going to continue with our journey through uh, the life of the Messenger of Allah as you see it's not a storytelling you are doing all the work you're supposed to read it at home and I'm just you know talking and taking things out of it at the very beginning it won't be polarity management it won't be these kind of things because we're still at the very beginning but at the end we will look at the even the psychological frameworks that the Prophet used which back then didn't have a name but we, we now see it as being a part of a structure or a framework or a therapy um, that is now being recognized as being one. And back then, it was just the teaching. We're just not minimalizing it. Just the teaching of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what we are going to do. Now we're at the very beginning. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ, we're on page 99, we see that the Prophet ﷺ traveled, oh sorry, we, we went too far. We, we didn't speak about the noble birth of the Prophet ﷺ. So, what I wanted to talk about today as well is very often when we think of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, very often we think about a youth which was uh, like almost a very sad one. Because indeed, his father died before he was born ﷺ. And his mother died when he was still very young. And then he was raised in the desert with Halima and so forth. So we, 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 look, at, we look back at the life of the Messenger of Allah and the first thing that very often comes to our mind is that the Prophet had a very uh, poor and sad youth. And when we think of him, very often we think of him as being very poor, of being very needy. And in a position where he didn't find anything, wasn't able to provide for his family, and so forth and so forth. When we are going to dissect the seerah of the Messenger of Allah, we are going to see that financially, in the majority of cases, not always, of course, because life has got ups and downs, but that the Messenger of Allah very often found himself in very stable financial situations. But he had to go through these less rich or economical stable situations so that he would also set an example for people who are not as well off financially. How should they live life when everything doesn't seem to go as well and everything doesn't be so, so you know, within a hand reach? So the Messenger of Allah lived both lives. And that doesn't make a messenger better. And that would certainly not make a messenger worse because a messenger can never be worse. And this is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Sulaiman, alayhi salam, who was given like this richness and kingdom, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ni'm al abd. And he, he was a blessed servant. Why? Innahu awwab. Because he was submitted. He was continuously returning to Allah. And when he spoke about Ayyub alayhi salam, who went through a period of disease and, and, and of, uh, of poverty, he said, Ni'm al abd. Inna wajadnahu sabira, Ni'm al abd. Innahu awab. He is blessed, he is, he was submissive. So we're not saying that it would change our view on the message of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam if we were to say that he was always poor. That wouldn't make the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam Better or not better, I even though I want to say this, we're talking from a theoretical point of view, I don't know how to put it otherwise. So it wouldn't uh, do this. But, and this is also why we are not going to make it into a debate. Like, no, he wasn't. Yes, he was. It's not a part of our creed. So you can very well look at his life and say, no, for the majority of the time he was poor. And I say for the majority of the time he's rich. 
So it doesn't really affect our aqidah. It's not an issue of aqidah. It's an issue of looking at his life from a certain perspective. So what I'm going to do, I wrote down and I, I shared with you some of it, but there is more to come. The financial transactions that the Prophet ﷺ did during his life of buying and selling, being it camels, being it you know, uh, horses, being it jewels, being it you know, armory, being it so many different things. And you will see that if you were to count everything, that you find someone who possessed a lot, but he didn't possess it with his heart. He possessed it with his hand and wasn't afraid to spend it. And when you are going to look at his life, you will see that the very reason why he at certain moments in time was not so well off financially was not because he wasn't working. It was because he was spending on the people. You see this? So when you look at the boycott, uh, when that happened in Mecca, as we will see, during three years almost, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, was spending on the people of his own money. From his own money. He was spending on them, feeding on them. He was able, otherwise many Muslims would have died. They wouldn't have come out. But he was able to uphold them also through his own personal money. And so this is very important for me also to know that when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, died, he immediately inherited his father. Because very often we hear that nobody wanted to take care of the Messenger وسلم, because he didn't have a father that would spend on him. Because the Arabs, they used to send their sons to the desert for many reasons. One was, see the jihad, <laughs> uh, not, he was not the reason of course, but was, uh, how do you call it? Your art. Archery training. Archery training, horseback riding. So they would send them to the desert. The Prophet ﷺ was perfect at it. That was one reason. Second reason was healthy life. Even though that we look at the desert and Mecca, but it was, you know, that was the, it was a town, but the desert was still healthier. Also from a psychological point of view, people were richer, stronger, less spoiled. Thirdly, is because the Arab was stronger in the desert. In the Arab, the Arabs, the, 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 the Arabic that the people in the desert would talk would be stronger than the Arabic that the people in town would talk. Because people in town, they got mixed up with people from different parts of the Arabic world. You know, they, they would trade and they would go to Yemen, they would go to Syria. And this is, Rihlat al shitai was safe. You know, a journey during the summer and a journey during the winter. So their Arabic was still pure, but it got mixed with dialects. In the desert, this wasn't the case. And they say about Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah that after the year 150, no new words would be accepted in the dictionary apart from words that Imam Shafi'i would pronounce that weren't known to the majority of people. This is how strong it was in the Arabic language. So now to come back, these were some of these reasons, you know, to, to become strong. Today, to be quite frank, we, if we look at the life of the Messenger of Allah, salam, his endurance, his patience, it's true that first and last it's God-given. But on the other hand, he's also an example, meaning that the climate he was raised in and the way that he was raised in eventually will lead to certain qualities which he had. And if we look today at the way that a lot of children are being raised, very often they are being spoiled. They are not, no longer connected to their creator and no longer connected to nature. They are connected to screens. And these are not the people that will become leaders and these are not the people that will be able to lead other people. The Messenger وسلم, the way he was brought up and then the way that he used to be a shepherd, the way that he used to trade, the way that, that he would take care of animals and then would stand up for people was exactly that which formed him into this, transformed him into this perfect leader. So the first thing that we need to do now, if we lose on this generation, we need to wait for 40 more years. If we, if we now don't raise our children well, we have to wait until they are 30 or 20, and they have children that will turn 20, and then we'll be the leaders. Do we want this? And with leaders, I don't mean a, a black flag with white letters. I mean leaders in goodness. 
people that take responsibility in society for Muslims and non-Muslims. So are we really going to waste this? One of my scholars once said, someone not raising his children to, yani, to change the world, bi-idhnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is like someone burning his own money. If this generation doesn't do it, finished. We, we, we don't seem to realize that if we don't do it, it will take 40 years at least. This is the responsibility we have. So now we have to, we need to look at how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was raised. What were these qualities? Because they are were his blueprint. You know the blueprint in the first lives, in the first years of your life, you cannot, usually can't get rid of. The first things that you live um, in your subconscious, but nevertheless, they form you. They make you who you are. The sounds that you hear, the arguments between your parents, uh, the, the yelling of your parents when you are a baby, you say, oh, stop crying, I'm tired. You are actually making, creating this blueprint. So the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, instead of being this needy, poor child, he was actually, yes, he didn't have his father. But he had, on the one hand, his grandfather. So in his grandfather, he found traits of his father and more. Because Abdullah was brought up by his father. And we know, once you go towards the 40, you start saying, how much do I resemble my father or my mother? You start seeing in yourself, like, I'm... I, I'm talking like my father. Sometimes I even don't know why when I drive the car, I put my hand in a certain way on the, how do you call that, the gearbox? And I put my, my wrist in a certain way. I said, this is what my father did. And I'm not calculating it. It's just happening. So the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had his father and more. Not meaning that it's, it wasn't painful and that a father isn't needed and that a grandfather can replace a father. So I ruled everything out. So don't. But he had his father in his grandfather and then he also had his uncle. So he was raised by people upholding the flag of the Arabic tribes. He was a noble son and his son of noble, well established financially and also socially people. This is what we need to know. They always say Buddha was the, the, the son of a prince and uh, he was a prince and the, so forth. Well, the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, he wasn't a prince, but he was the child of notable people, of very noble people that were held very high within society. Which also led to him being preserved, but also shows us that he wasn't that poor man. When the Prophet ﷺ was born, his grandfather fed the animals, all the animals of Mecca, and all the people in Mecca, including the slaves, for three days. Who can do this? This is not poor. All the animals and all the people in Mecca, for three days, say, I am your host. Eat what you want. They said that he sacrificed so many camels and sheep that one wouldn't be able to count them. So this was when the Prophet ﷺ was born. Then he inha- inherited, like is on your document, he inherited from his father silver. He inherited from him a very precious you know, armory. He inherited from his father animals and so much more. So the people, when they looked at Muhammad ﷺ, Lying there, lay, do we say laying or lying down? When they, as a baby, lying down, it was not like, oh, we're not going to take care of Muhammad because his family hasn't got any money. This is very often what we hear. They say nobody wanted him. The reason why they didn't want him in their heart is because it was the risk of Halima. And when Allah wants someone to find someone, he turns away all the hearts so that this one heart can find that what Allah wants it to find. That's the only reason. And this is the same reason why Musa alayhi salam didn't want to drink the milk from any, any mother. When they adopted Musa alayhi salam, then Fir'aun, you know, and the, the wife of Fir'aun, she had a child herself, some say, some say no, whatever. But he didn't want the milk of anyone. Fir'aun 
asked people from different parts of the world, mothers that were uh, giving milk to their children, to come, and he refused every milk. So this is where the story of the, the sister of Musa came in. She said, I have, what? A mother who has milk. Now you can say, okay, but they will ask, who is the other baby? Some say that Musa and Harun were born together. They were not identical twins. So this is what some say. We don't know. There's no isnat. But what we know is that she also had another child. So now, when the mother of Musa came, this was the only milk that he used to drink for, from, from his own biological mother, sitting in the palace of Fir'aun, feeding the child that he was supposed to kill. So when Allah veils your heart or opens your heart, there is nobody that can change this. Ya muqallib al qulub, Allah turns it the way He wants. So now when people didn't want to take care of Muhammad it's not because he didn't have a noble ancestry. He had the most noble one. It's not because he was an orphan. Because they knew he inherited from whom? From his father. They knew who his grandfather was and they knew who his uncle was. So there was no reason not to do it. But he was the risk of Halima. Because Halima was worth it. Is that clear? So now all of a sudden, this story seems to have another dimension. Instead of everybody going, oh, this poor baby, we don't want him, he has got no money. No, everybody would have wanted him, but it was the risk of Halima. Okay, is this part of the story clear? Okay, so now the reason why they took him, uh, why people used to take the children to the desert was to, you know, to turn them into men. A man, how do you define a man? Well, with one word, by one word, responsibility. But responsibility doesn't mean financial responsibility. Also emotional responsibility, being responsible for not breaking the heart of your wife. Responsible for not breaking the heart of your children or your mother. So responsibility entails everything. Responsible that of you know, ensuring that everything goes well. Which doesn't mean that a woman is not responsible, please. Huh? Okay, everybody's responsible, like the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Kullukum mas'ul. Everybody amongst you is responsible. So now, this is what they wanted to do. So, a young boy who's 25 years old and still playing PlayStation won't become a new Ertugrul. He won't become a Muhammad al Fatih. Or Abu Ayyub al How? Sahadin al-Ayubi or whatever. Um, so now in brief, this is what they used to do. They would send their people to the desert for that reason. When Halima, from the moment that Halima picked up Muhammad salam, all of a sudden Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, created more milk so that th- her own child wouldn't suffer. So she immediately saw the barakah. And this is what we believe to be true. The more you spend, the more you get. <laughs> the more you spend, the more you get. Like the Sha'ir said, the poet, like Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, as we mentioned in his tafsir, uh, in Surah At-Takathur, he said, Anta lil mali in amsaktahu wa idha anfaqtahu falmalu lak. You belong to money as long as you hold money for yourself. But when you spend money, money is truly yours. Because when you spend it, you have made, turned your money into something eternal. Is that clear? So now, she immediately found this. And then we come to the point that she also saw that uh, that her sheep or goat, sorry, were also carrying more milk, that the desert uh, ground around her become, became green. I don't have to say all of this. Everybody knows it. But now we come to a point where the heart of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was taken out of his body. And what happened there? Now, before the open heart operation, people would say this is impossible, but people do it every day. Like, doctors go, surgeons go, this is a heart. The person is still alive, put it back in the body, they go like, tick, and the heart goes again. So now to outrule and to say this is impossible, actually even someone not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's miracles could say that this could be possible, taking out the heart of a person. We believe that it were the angels that did it. Okay? Uh, one of the forces of the unseen. But why did this happen? Well, why did you think that it happened? Why, what did the angels do? 
Why did they take out the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? I want to uh, hear your answer. Yes, Habib. Clean it. Excuse me. To clean it. Clean it from what? Um, like, um, not literally, like. Okay. You can explain it. Um, explain it with your own words. There's no wrong answer. Okay, to purify his heart so that his soul and thoughts would be pure. Like that? Okay. Somebody else? Who differs? Who agrees? This can't be true. I said, who differs? No one. Who agrees? No one. So what does this mean? I have no opinion. Uh, yes. Who, yes. Um, if it was taken out, not to literally clean it, but to, to symbolically clean it, cleanse it of evil, and perhaps it, the, 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 the story of it being taken out is also not literal. You mean figuratively? Yes, it is figuratively. Okay. That's metaphorically. metaphorically. Okay. Somebody else? Yes. So they may be showing one of the miracles of Allah that truly this is a prophet who's come, you know, by this thing happening, which is quite fantastic. Okay. But there was other children there who then ran and said, you know, he's, he's dead, he's dead, and all of a sudden his boy looks back and he has them in the mark. Yes. So maybe this is what to show the people who know there was people who give the Christian scriptures who understood this that this truly is a prophet. Okay, to show that it's a, a truly a prophet and a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we know, need to know is that there has never been evil in the Prophet. Some say, uh, and they elaborate, they say that shaitan has a certain space within your heart through which he whispers. Now, I'm like in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, you can read it under uh, the Surah Al Nas. Try to read it. And, but this only happens from the moment you become an adolescent. It's not when you're a baby. Like some people, when a baby yawns, they quickly put their hand in front of the mouth of the baby. Because they say, when you yawn, shaitan comes in. Babies are protected. Without you doing this, they are protected. So now, what some of the scholars say that this was the part within the heart, literally a space, through which shaitan whispers, that was closed before shaitan would ever have the opportunity to whisper. So it never happened. He was never... Uh, submitted to the whispering of shaitan and shaitan his personal jinn that everybody has like in Sahih Muslim yani converted to Islam like the messenger of Allah wasalam, said like everybody has a qareen of the jinn with him inspiring him to do bad but a qareen wouldn't have any job because you can't inspire the prophet wasalam, to do something bad so he said apart from mine he converted to Islam yani Allah made him a Muslim. Okay, So this would be one of the explanations that our scholars give. And Ibn al-Qayyim in his book Zad al-Ma'at elaborates on this. So in brief, this would be one of the possible explanations. So it was not something bad in the heart. There was never evil in the Prophet ﷺ. It was just closing the gate through which shaitan does waswasa. Is that clear? So want to, it was closing it before yes, shaitan would be able Exactly, because at that age, shaitan doesn't whisper. Shaitan doesn't whisper. The only thing that shaitan does, like the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, like Imam Suyuti rahimahullah azawajal mentioned in the jami'ah, he said that everybody uh, is, is poked, you say poked, right? Uh, by shaitan, the moment he he's born, he or she is born, you know, to make him cry, he said, apart from Isa ibn Maryam, apart from Isa, uh, because of the dua of the, the mother of Isa, like in Surah Al Imran. So anyway, uh, the whispering doesn't happen until you have a good understanding of what is evil and what isn't. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's maybe relevant here, but uh, the, this instance of, of taking the heart out, yeah. but it's not the only time. No, it was twice. It yes. Yes, yes. Now we're just mentioning this occasion here. Yeah. So what do we understand from a practical side here is that we are going to raise our children in such a way that we close the door to waswasa by 
bringing them up with a good upbringing, which is a child connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you look at the way that the Messenger of Allah used to teach his companions, a great majority or a great number of the companions were children. Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, and so many more, they were actually children. Like when the Prophet ﷺ said, like in the very known hadith, when, he was, when, when Abdullah ibn Abbas was on a camel behind him, he said, Ya Ghulam, oh Ghulam, yani some say Ghulam between 9 and 11 years old, he said, I'm going to teach you some important words. Preserve the religion of Allah and Allah will protect you. So he, he used to, and he told Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ took me by the shoulder and he said, live in this world. You know, and he said, and use your health before you are you become sick, and your sorry before you die, and your health be, before you come sick. So anyway, what we understand from this is that we need to connect our children to Allah. To be quite frank, what do we expect from people looking at SpongeBob all the time? A sponge that talks. Here I am, a sponge, and I talk. So I mean, Subhan. Then when your child irritates you because it can't sit still, it's jumping up and down, it's main, making these strange faces, strange noises, this is what you have been showing your child. No, I'm not saying you, in general. This is what you have been showing your child all the time. So why are you surprised when your child is imitating a sponge? Subhanallah. So well, I'm not saying that your child shouldn't have a a nice childhood, but there's something, you know, when, when we were young, we would come back home dirty with cars, we were climbing in trees, running behind rabbits, not meaning we didn't have any rabbits, but we were, you know, playing. And, and now today, it's all on a tablet. Not that long ago, in a mall, the, I'm immediately with you, inshallah. I said, you know, a child, one year, in, one, year, one year old, maybe, or one year and a half, was just on a tablet, all the way, while the parents were walking. Because this is easy. When your child doesn't stop crying, put it in front of the television that you... Well, if you had a child, you're responsible for it, remember? So then you need to invest of your time. And to educate it, give it love. Sit with it, talk to it. And so this is what we understand from this part, is that when you want to create a good leader, then one, from when it's very young, teach its skills while playing, horseback riding, archery, whatever, swimming, uh, even soccer, whatever you like. And then on the other hand, also protect its heart by connecting its soul yani to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when the shaitan wants to whisper, that it doesn't find a receptor for his whispering because the child has been protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? Um, I'm wondering what the halal alternative is. Like, how do you actually because nowadays children are on them from like age one, two, you know, and they're not in school then. And you know, what is the modern day equivalent of like sending your child to uh, the desert essentially? Because nowadays we don't have to play in the streets, we're worried about security. So like should we as a community be like thinking about the camps and things that we organize? To be quite frank, this are they, you know, yeah. at that age when they're really young, they're too young for like proper activity. <laughs> Until they're about like five or so. Yes, I, I believe I believe that there are many many activities within the Muslim community where children can take part, like uh, retreats, like uh, sports. Sporting is very good. There is scouting. There are so many things where I'm not saying that if your child looks like five minutes at a tablet that it will be transformed into a monster, but it shouldn't be the majority of the time, and especially not when the child is still very young. And it's good to read some scientific researches about what these screens do to the mind and to the brain of a child. And like Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah said, like your child has been given to you as a rough diamond. You, you can shape it. It's a diamond. And he said, so sculpture your diamond and make it shine. And this is what we should do. And we are responsible for what it thinks, what it does. Uh, for the school that we choose, for the sport center that we go to, to the things that we expose it to. So uh, sports uh, is one of the, the, the best things one, one can do. And to make it an addict to screens is one of the worst things one can do. 
Well, I'm, but I can't elaborate on this. But there are many, a lot of alternatives that we find today. So from a practical point of view, do you see the connection? Like the Prophet ﷺ, during this period, he was also protected, he was well raised, he was well fed, uh, he was well loved. They say that his grandfather would take him and he said, Ya, Muh- ya oh my small grandson, come here. And then he would put Muhammad Sallam on the carpet of the leader, which was a sofa, who no one would sit on. But he would nevertheless take his grandson and put him on that sofa. You know, and then people would look, and then <laughs> Muhammad Sallam one day when he was a, a baby boy, only two, three years old. They were taking him to his mother. Don't forget, he wasn't all the time in the desert without seeing his mother. Like uh, Ibn Sayyid al-Nas mentioned in his book, Nur al-Uyun. He said like, Muhammad Sallam would be brought to his mother to see his mother. So he, the majority of the time he would be outside, and then he would be brought to his mother. And one day he, uh, he got lost. So Muhammad Sallam, he's, uh, his family was looking for him, his mother was desperate because Halima wanted to take him to his mother and, and then he, he, you know, he got lost and they were looking for him and then they found him sitting on the sofa at the Kaaba. <laughs> so, uh, subhanAllah, it's all a very beautiful thing to be quiet. And when I look at it, I look with a smile, I look with love and warmth and, and I really see that, subhanAllah, and this is where we, uh, what time is it now? Allahu Akbar. Oh, time goes fast, isn't it? Like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى Right? So that he found him needy, as a need, I'm right away with you, as a needy person, and he enriched you, or and so forth. So what you need to know here is that the fa in the Arabic language shows that something will happen immediately after that which preceded it. Is that clear? And this is why you see in Surah Maryam, everything is with a fa. فَحَمَلَتْهُ فَانْتَبَذَتْ بِهِ مَكَانًا قَصِيًّا Do you hear the fa? فَأَجَاءَهَا الْمَخَادُ إِلَى جِذْعِ النَّخْلَ no? And then she said, يعني, everything is with a fa. Why? Because it was very quickly. Like Abdullah ibn Abbas said, she carried Isa in an hour. And so it took one hour for him to grow. One hour to give birth, and then it was, that was it. Why? Because Isa alayhi salam wasn't created from that which we are created from. Because he was not formed or was not given to Maryam by a human being. He was immediately created in the shape he was in. Immediately that baby. He didn't go through this, what? Through these different stages. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Al Imran, إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَىٰ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam, and Isa's creation was exactly like Adam's creation. He created them from turab, and he said, كُنْ, be, and they became. And this is why we see the fa in Surah Maryam. It was all one after the other. And this is why Abdullah ibn Abbas said, she carried him yani, in one hour. She So anyway... Yani the moment that you were in need in the state of an orphan. That's the state of someone who is in need. But fa'agna, he immediately enriched you through your grandfather, through your inheritance, through uh, your uncle. So there was actually no space in time where Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam was not connected to someone who was fulfilling some of the needs at that particular moment. It was his mother was there, Halima was there, mother died, Halima was still there. Then grandfather was there, grandfather died, uncle was there. Uncle died, Khadija was there. So in a certain way, we see that the fa'agna means there was a state which would be the state of a needy person, but it was immediately resolved. This is one of the possible explanations. There are people that will disagree, and I don't say that they are wrong. But this is an explanation I believe in after doing my research and tafsir and sitting with uh, Mashaykh and asking them questions. So in very brief, we see that it's ac- actually a reflection of the last ayah, فَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Speak, talk, mention the blessings of your Lord. The fact that from the moment you were عَائِل, needy, immediate, immediately due to the fa, you were, be ta- you were taken care of. Is, is, is that clear for everybody? MashaAllah, you are so patient with me. 
I keep on talking and talking and talking and I must have tired you. So I'm very, very sorry. Um, in brief, uh, the time is up. So uh, I, I would just like to ask you some questions. And you had a question, sorry. Yes. Uh, the question is, um, as mothers we are told to cattle our infants for about two and a half years. Can you say this again, please? If when the baby is born, you have to be a nursing mother for it. Baby, yes. But clear, sorry, clear, sorry, 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 sor